to start things off, we should probably at least briefly check in on how the Republican primaries are going. Mm -hmm. Last we checked, Donald Trump had managed to garner more votes than all of his opponents combined in the Iowa caucus, which kicked off the primaries, resulting in both Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis <laughs> finally throwing in the towel. It's pronounced winner. Throwing in the towel and endorsing the man who had made them his bitch. Just yeah. crying and groveling at his feet. And now we know why Ron DeSantis threw in the towel, because he was going to get uh, destroyed by not, well, by both Donald Trump, but also Nikki Haley. And he is a type of guy who absolutely could not stand He's not being beat by a woman. He is not likable. But yeah, this left just one remaining obstacle between Trump and the Republican nomination. Nikki Haley, who has positioned herself as kind of like a throwback to the way Republicans used to be when they believed basically the exact same things, but they didn't say the quiet part out loud. Yeah, they were a lot more subtle about their hatred and restrictive policies. Anyways, this week's uh, New Hampshire primary was an important test case for whether they should even bother doing Republican primaries in the other 48 states. Would all of those DeSantis and Ramaswamy voters do as their candidates had done and accept the inevitability of a Trump nomination, resulting in a pathetic, crushing defeat for Nikki Haley? Well, it turns out not really. I mean, Trump definitely won, but it was in no way a blowout. Uh, it was close enough that Haley seems pretty committed to staying in the race for now. With most of the votes counted, Donald Trump won 54.3% of the votes versus Nikki Haley's 43.3%, with Trump picking up 12 delegates and Haley's nine delegates. This would seem to indicate that a good chunk of DeSantis and Ramaswamy supporters are still on the anyone but Trump train, but it's also worth noting that in New Hampshire, nearly half the electorate is registered as independent, and they allow independents to vote in whichever primary they choose. When you look at just registered Republicans, it's a lot more of a blowout with only around a quarter going for Haley and the rest for Trump. So yeah, New Hampshire is weird and probably not very representative of how Republican primaries will go in other states. The one like somewhat good stat was that people seem to seem to be against voting for Trump if that were the choice, the Haley supporters switching over to if he was the candidate versus the other way around. So, but that's all just people saying shit. They'll always just vote whatever their Republican Party is doing. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the next primary is Nevada in two weeks, which, due to some weird nonsense that I'm not even going to go into, Nikki Haley isn't even on the ballot for it. They're doing a caucus and a primary hmm. at the same time. There's a lot of the backstory behind it. It's fascinating. I, it's, it's just, it's pointless. Yeah. But uh, anyway, then after that, it's South Carolina two weeks after that, and uh, that's Nikki Haley's home state where she was previously the governor. Well, that doesn't matter because Big Tim Scott is, uh, he's going to rally everyone yeah. behind Donald Trump, the, the man who he is getting engaged for. Yeah, he is getting engaged. Uh, let's see how long that lasts. It took him 60 years, but he finally found the right woman. And uh, he is, I, I, the way I view that is, that is uh, him trying to punch his ticket to the vice presidency. That will absolutely never happen. Because George Santos is going to be the vice president. That's right, baby. And then Trump's going to have a heart attack on the swearing-in ceremony. And then we're living in Santos' America. That's right. But yeah, North Carolina would seem like... South it, Carolina. Sorry, South Carolina seems like it would probably be a potential easy win for Nikki Haley. But eh, the polls say otherwise. And after a month straight of Trump shitting on her exclusively, she might decide that it's not worth the embarrassment of losing in her home state. So, yeah. Basically, it seems like, despite how close it was in New Hampshire, Trump has this shit already locked down. Which is hilarious, given the months and months of Republican debates that Trump didn't even bother attending, mm -hmm. featuring candidates who, from the start, we have been saying this entire time, will never be president. None of them. It's also insane that an overwhelming majority of Republicans just are not even interested in maybe having a backup plan for Trump getting potentially found guilty of just a shitload of serious crimes between now and the election. Mm -hmm. And combine that with the Democrats' insistence on sticking with Biden, despite his approval, even among Democrats, not being all that great. And we are gearing up for a real shit show this November. Yeah. To, Yeehaw! To his credit, Biden got a big endorsement from the United Auto Workers today. And what? could you guess what happened? During that, uh, someone justifiably started screaming at him no, for the geno genocide that he's helping to fund e every, with our tax dollars. Every event he he does, there's uh, and good he protests. should yes yeah. yeah yeah it's uh, 
You're not weaseling your way out of this one, Joe. No. It's, it, it is mind-boggling to me. Stupid. And uh, it's not going to be any of our faults yeah. if he doesn't fucking win. Not my problem. Anyways, we got 10 months to wallow in existential dread about that election. So let's not dwell on it for right now. There is, of course, Elon Musk news to cover, baby. And, <sighs> and it's a real doozy. So as you know, Elon's social media venture has not gone great. Advertisers, the financial lifeblood of all free websites, have fled. Thanks to not only the fact that the timeline is noticeably flooded with hate speech from accounts that Elon refuses to ban, but also Elon's own posts and interactions, which, to the casual observer, give off the slight impression that this Elon Musk guy, I don't know, he kind of seems like he might be a bit of a Nazi. If I'm just taking these posts as face value as someone who doesn't follow this guy, or even someone who does. Yeah. Uh, some Hitler, I'm picking up some Hitler particles. Yes, there are... There are Adolf vibes coming off of these posts. Uh, so to remedy this, he went over to Israel a few months back to kiss Benjamin Netanyahu's ring and act somber about the October 7th attacks. But the advertisers, they remained aloof. So this week... Plan B. Yeah, he doubled down. He, he teamed up with Ben Shapiro to go visit Auschwitz. So to be clear, visiting a Nazi death camp, it's something that probably everyone should do at some point. Yes. The Holocaust is something we learn about in books and movies, but actually being where it happened and seeing it with your own eyes, it's a very powerful experience. Yeah, I went to Dachau uh, a very long time ago, and it was life-altering. Yeah, it takes something abstract and it makes it, makes it real for you. And that's increasingly important as you know more time passes between then and now. Having said that, Visiting Auschwitz explicitly in order to launder your image and do PR damage control is kind of, maybe more than kind of, an insult to the over one million people who died there. Yeah. Going there with Ben Shapiro, of all people, is also an interesting choice. Because, you know, Ben Shapiro, he, he is Jewish. He makes that a big part of his identity. But aside from that, he has shown himself to be just as racist, sexist, homophobic, and transphobic as the Twitter users that the advertisers don't want their ads showing up under. Mm -hmm. His ultra-conservative views on most topics are actually pretty out of step with most Jewish Americans, whose views generally lean the opposite direction. Yeah. So, an interesting choice. On top of this concentration camp visit clearly being a stunt, this is Elon. So, of course, he made it even worse by talking. At an event following the visit, Musk said on stage with Shapiro, I must admit to being somewhat, frankly, naive about this. In the circles that I move, I see almost no anti-Semitism. Two-thirds of my friends are Jewish. I have twice as many Jewish friends as non-Jewish friends. I'm like Jewish by association. I'm aspirationally Jewish. So I was like, what are people talking about with this anti-Semitism? Because I never hear it at dinner conversations. It's like an absurdity, at least in my friend circles. Some of my best friends are Jewish. Uh, also, <laughs> he did the George Santos thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little Jewish. You know, I have so many Jewish friends that I'm like, I'm kind of... Pretty much basically Jewish myself. And if not that, I am aspirationally Jewish. Yeah. I want desperately to be Jewish. I, it would be funny if, like, because this stunt doesn't seem like it's going to work to bring back the advertisers. What if he converts? That would be amazing. Elon Musk in a yarmulke all the time would be very cool. Learning uh, Hebrew phrases and then just just mangling them. Uh -huh. He would, you know, it, it's... This is all so dumb and obvious that it will be washed away in no yeah. time. Yeah, I don't think he's fooling anyone. No. But, uh, I mean, yeah, look, I guess it's entirely possible that in all this time since making anti-wokeness his core trait, Elon somehow never noticed that a lot of his newer supporters have some very interesting thoughts on the Jews. That's kind of hard to believe, though, when one of the incidents that drove advertisers away was Elon literally endorsing the conspiracy theory that Jews are trying to replace white people with minorities. He, he said, you've said the exact truth yes. or whatever. <laughs> like, there's no mincing the words. Yeah, uh, maybe. He, no, it's <laughs> the, the problem is he doesn't understand what he's doing is anti-Semitic. Yeah, like I think it just comes down to he's he's kind of a fucking idiot. Yeah, he doesn't grasp like the concept of it or why it would be offensive or any of that. He's just he sees things in such a weird, yeah, black and white way. He is a useful idiot for yes. bigots. Yes. So yeah, Elon said at the event that X has the least amount of anti-Semitism compared to other social media networks, despite. Several studies showing that the exact opposite is true. Well, he was clearly talking about Gab and 8chan. Yeah. Yeah. Technically correct. Yeah, the other ones. <laughs> yeah. Truth. 
But yeah, you don't even have to look at a study to know that. The whole that Brooklyn Hasidic Jew tunnel story from like two weeks ago, that absolutely flooded the site with insane, overtly anti-Semitic conspiracy theories for an entire week. You couldn't miss it. And that was X. Weirdly, didn't see, uh, didn't see that flooding my timelines on Instagram or I don't use Facebook, but didn't hear about anything over there. Even Reddit. You, <laughs> the, the George Soros stuff for years, like, we just had that element uh, hanging over it. I saw, I saw, like, like uh, at this point, I feel like I've seen all the, like, hallmark anti-Semitic, like, memes, the Wojaks and whatnot. Yeah. I saw, like, so many new ones two weeks ago when the, that tunnel news happened. It yeah. was like, damn, these guys have been working in the, the mines, drawing up new fucking anti-Semitic caricatures to yeah, replace the old uh, ones. Twitter's homepage is the, is the new Stormfront. It is quite shocking. So for him to <laughs> even claim yeah, that this like, isn't happening. Come on. And you know that he has dinner looking at Twitter every night. So he is hanging out with his Twitter buddies while eating dinner. Yeah. And seeing blatant anti-Semitism. So anyway, by far the most insane and counterproductive thing to come out of Elon's trip to Auschwitz was a little slideshow that he put together. He presented it to the audience. And uh, yeah, it seemed like he was making the case that if X had been around in the 1930s and 40s, Folks, the Holocaust would not have happened. Step aside, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> Mark Wahlberg saying 9-11 wouldn't have happened if he had been on that plane. That is nothing compared to Elon Musk saying he could have prevented the Holocaust. Elon Musk if only X had been around. walked into Auschwitz and said, if I had been there, things would have been different. I could have stopped this. <laughs> insane. In, legitimately insane behavior. So uh, Also categorically wrong. Yeah, like everyone, yeah. even Every, the weirdest weirdos would know this to not be true. But... It's just extra nuts that Elon would say that out loud. How can I be anti-Semitic if I run a company that, had it existed 80 years ago, would have stopped the Holocaust? Checkmate. So yeah, as an abstract argument, this is already absurd and arguably anti-Semitic. Yeah. But uh, he brought out literal fake tweets to support this point. Now, these tweets, they document the events of the Holocaust as if they were happening in real time, with the implication being that if this information was readily available at the time by people reporting things on the ground as they were happening, uh, things would have never gotten to where they did. Uh, we would all have seen that and been like, hey, that's not cool. We're going to stop that. This is happening right now, and it's not stopping. And yeah, there's even a tweet from at Auschwitz camp official. I love the idea that the Auschwitz concentration camp would have a Twitter account. Yes. Uh, uh, then why does it exist, Elon? Uh -huh. Why does it need the, the so Twitter account? At Auschwitz camp official says... Members of the thriving Jewish community in our camp perform a rehearsal with musical instruments, high spirits, and that's got a community note attached saying the Jewish community in Auschwitz is striving for food, not thriving. The orchestra is being used to help Nazis kill Jews in masses. Sorry, Auschwitz, you got community noted. Community note solves this. That's it. And then everyone clapped, and, yeah. and then Hitler shot himself. Years before he was so he yeah did. he was so upset by the community notes that yeah. uh, he we ratioed himself. Hitler into killing himself. That's right. That's how things would have gone differently. Um, wow, bravo, insane. <laughs> so okay, yes, a few points. First off, the Holocaust came after several years of increasingly restrictive laws limiting the rights of Jewish people, and this was not a secret. In fact, it was pretty controversial outside Germany at the time, which is saying something because most people in Europe and the U.S. were still pretty anti-Semitic. <laughs> they had rallies here at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, they were pretty cool with anti-Semitism, but Hitler took it too far even for them. Uh, so, yeah, they, they thought Hitler was even going a little too far, but notably, it didn't bother them enough to actually want to take in Jewish refugees from Germany. And here's the Jewish Telegraphic Agency who had a pretty good response to all of this. The problem with Jews was not that they didn't have the information. The problem was they didn't have options said Doris Bergen, a Holocaust historian at the University of Toronto and scholar in residence at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Where were German Jews supposed to go? Who was providing refuge for elderly people, people with disabilities, and others deemed not valuable as workers? Bergen noted that half of Germany's Jews, those who had the contacts and resources needed to escape the Nazi regime, actually did leave the country between 1933 and 1939. Those included Anne Frank's family, who went to the Netherlands. 
But the Nazis caught up with them after occupying that country in 1940, as they did with the Jews in Poland, Hungary, France, the Soviet Union, and the other nations they invaded. What would social media have done for these people who in many cases were killed at the same time as the Germans invaded? Asked Bergen. Other experts quoted in the article point out that it's just as likely the Nazis would have used social media as a tool to further their cause, which makes sense given their embrace of new technologies like radio. And Gabriel Rosenfeld, president of the uh, New York Center for Jewish History, gets to the heart of this whole stunt with, this fantasy is a self-serving one. It enables Musk to switch the conversation away from his allowing right-wing anti-Semites to post freely on X, which have increasingly discredited his platform, by claiming it would have served a social good if, and that's a big if, it had existed 80 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's so absurd and frankly offensive and also annoying because he's forcing people to have this conversation when it's like, this is all a fucking distraction. It's... Uh, again, this, of all of the things that he's done, and he's done a lot, this has hurt my brain in ways I didn't think was possible anymore from Elon Musk. Yeah. And it's very cool of Ben Shapiro to, like, very calculatedly just be like, well, you know, the anti-Semitism on X, pretty bad. Like, it's in his own fucking replies. Yes. He sees this He deals shit. with it daily, yes. To say, like, that's pretty bad, but that's something, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make if it means that I can be hateful towards all these other groups. It's a trade-off. Also, I'm going to clean up Elon Musk's image for absolutely no reason, because as soon as I'm not useful to him... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, probably the strongest counterpoint to Elon's assertion that X would have prevented the Holocaust is that there is an ethnic cleansing literally happening right now in Gaza, and it's been very thoroughly documented by those experiencing it and sharing photos and videos to social media. And there's also lots and lots of uh, misinformation and disinformation coming from all different sides as well. Yes, and also, like, the nation at Israel is an account I see, like, every three tweets. They have flooded the platform with advertisements that are inescapable and which paint themselves in a very different light than the reality on the ground. Yes. But yeah, more than any other similar event in all of history, we have instant access to exactly what is happening in Gaza. We are literally seeing civilians get shot and blown up and forced from their homes due to entire cities being reduced to rubble. And despite all the outcry from people around the world who are paying attention to this on platforms like X, it hasn't really done jack shit to stop any of it. In fact, Elon Musk went there and did and, and was shaking hands with the guy who's responsible for the continued attacks. Yeah. I mean, it has at least provided evidence for, uh, just mountains of evidence for South Africa's case, which I don't have a lot of optimism about how that's going to turn out, but at least they're keeping track of it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in terms of where it actually matters, which is like the United States saying whether it can continue to happen or not, we do have the power to shut this down right now. No. It's not doing fucking or anything. Or at least pull out our fucking support, our direct monetary support of they, it. I mean, Israel has said literally like so many times, like the second the U.S. stops funding this, like that we have a big problem. Huh. <sighs> so yeah, I mean, you really could not have picked a worse time ever to make this idiotic argument that your platform would have prevented the Holocaust. Yes. We objectively can say it would not have. I am uh, very disheartened by so many things. So many things. It's just, yeah, I, 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 I'm speechless. I literally can't yeah, believe that he would try to pull this off. Uh, yeah, when I saw, like, oh, okay, he's going to Auschwitz, like, he's doing, doing Maybe he'll stuff. learn something. And yeah, it took, like, a little while for this news to come out where, like, people were, like, I saw people posting about, like, this happened. I'm like, well, that's a pretty insane thing to say. And then, and then I saw the actual, like, fake tweets. I'm like, holy fucking shit. This is wild. <sighs> Anyways, uh, we do have more, uh, hopefully uplifting or not. I don't no, know. No, it's not. Great. Uh, we have more news <laughs> to get into today. But first, got to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Masterclass. Now, picture that thing you've always wanted to learn. Now, picture learning it from the person who's literally the best at it in the world. That's what you get with Masterclass. This year, you learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass. Don't just talk about improving. Masterclass helps you actually do it. Masterclass offers over 180 world-class instructors, so whether you want to master negotiation with Chris Voss, think like a boss with Martha Stewart, or train your dog with Brandon McMillan, Masterclass has you covered. 
With Masterclass, you get unlimited access to intimate one-on-one -on -one classes with the world's best. We love Masterclass and you will too, because it's a great way to learn all sorts of stuff, even if it's not necessarily something you're going to be doing yourself. Like, even if you're not planning on directing a movie, it's still fascinating learning about the filmmaking processes of James Cameron, Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, Werner Herzog, and more. And along the way, you learn a lot of lessons that you can apply to your own life. There are over 200 classes to pick from, with new classes added every month, like Roy Choi's cooking class that really helped to demystify a lot of the things that I love about Korean food and feel more confident in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot about a lot of sauces. Yeah, there you go. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes from the world's best? Easily hundreds to thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's just $10 a month. Masterclass helps you learn anywhere, on TV, in the app, on their website, even in audio mode on the go. Plus, every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Right now, our viewers will get an additional 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash newsday. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash newsday. That is masterclass.com slash newsday. All right, back to the news now, and let's talk about AI. Oh, told you it wasn't going to get any better. Ah, oh, 2024, you were supposed to be the good one. So AI has had a pretty huge leap forward in just the past couple years, with AI now seriously threatening to replace humans in various occupations. And new progress is continuing to happen at a rapid pace. Uh, the goal for companies developing AI technology is not just to make their products ubiquitous. They want AGI, artificial general intelligence, though none of them can really seem to articulate exactly what that would look like. Basically, though, it, it would just be really powerful AI that's, I guess, on par with or surpasses humans in terms of its capabilities. Now, for some people, this AI renaissance is exciting. For others, it's terrifying. For others, it's just annoying. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, one thing is for sure. The machines powering AI require an insane amount of electricity. And as they get more powerful, they're going to require even more electricity. I hope they have. Those AIs can figure out how to make more... Electricity. I mean, that would be the ultimate goal, is you, you feed them enough electricity that they figure out how to uh, not use as much electricity. The problem is, for all of us, we need the planet to be survivable to live on. The computers, they don't really need that. Yeah. They don't need to, like, breathe. Yeah. Anyway, this is a pretty huge problem when yeah. you consider the urgent need to reduce the world's CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. and you would hope that these AI billionaires would have a plan for that. But they don't. And here's futurism with some incredibly frustrating news on this topic. It's no secret that AI models like those behind OpenAI's ChatGPT require an astronomical amount of electricity. The process is ludicrously energy intensive, with experts estimating that the industry could soon suck up as much electricity as an entire country. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that OpenAI CEO Sam Altman is looking for cheaper alternatives. During a Bloomberg event at the annual World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, the billionaire suggested that the AI models of tomorrow may require even more power, to the degree that they'll need a whole new power source. There's no way to get there without a breakthrough, Altman told audiences, as quoted by Reuters. It motivates us to go invest more in fusion, adding that we need better ways to store energy from solar power. Fusion. So hmm. we, we talked about fusion energy a year ago or so when the Department of Energy announced what was reported as a huge breakthrough. But basically, fusion energy is the holy grail of energy independence. It would allow for virtually unlimited energy by basically harnessing the same process that keeps the stars burning bright for billions of years. We've known that it's possible for a very long time. But despite fusion energy being talked about like it's just around the corner for decades, it is not. We'll probably get there eventually. Every few years, there is some breakthrough step towards that end. But it's fucking insane to be promoting absurdly energy-dependent technology like AI at a time when irreversible climate change is knocking at the door and then just sort of shrug and say that, well, fusion will solve all this. It's, it's also like, it's such so frustrating because a lot of the negative PR downfall of things like NFT were due to the energy consumption. And it's yeah. like, what do you think is happening here? Can we all get back on that boat and be screaming about it once no. again? The Silicon Valley has a pathological need to waste electricity. Yeah, and, <laughs> and with NFTs, it's like, okay, yes, this sucks. Uh, but AI stuff has the uh, added benefit of also taking a ton of people's jobs while right. sucking Who up all this energy. Who is benefiting from this other than Sam Altman? I, I don't know, because the product that it produces is not good. And also, the, the product can be produced by people who need money to survive and 
live and eat and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. it's just funny. Like fu- saying that fusion will solve this is it's similar to Elon Musk saying like we don't have to worry about anything because we're all going to live on Mars someday. Yeah, it's like okay, but we've <laughs> I, that always aggravates me so much. And I'll say it again: we've got a beautiful. Yeah, perfectly no. good planet here and that we are actively ruining. Everyone who actually studies this shit, they're like, it would be orders of magnitude harder to terraform Mars than it would be to just not destroy the Earth. Take Elon Musk, you know, Auschwitz obviously didn't work, but take Elon Musk to go see like a waterfall. and But without any like, because I think the problem with rich people is when they go to experience some kind of like beautiful nature thing, they're just at a resort. And they're getting well, food and, and drinks and Mark everything. Mark Zuckerberg went to Hawaii and it was so pretty that he bought it. Yeah. Well, and kicked out everyone who uh, who was already there. So I don't right, know if maybe this is, that, maybe it's just impossible. the solution. Yeah. yeah. They can't just simply enjoy the, There's got to be alive. some kind of brain problem with not being able to look at nature and be like, wow, we should do something to save what we have instead of looking at the barren landscape of Mars and be like, wouldn't it be cool to live in a pod on that? Yeah, it so stupid. But yeah, this would all probably be less frustrating if there was a more obvious benefit to all this AI hype. To be clear, AI does show a lot of potential for stuff like medical and scientific research, that kind yeah, of thing. And it's helpful in small menial tasks, like the Siri stuff. Yeah. Or, like, yes, I'm not saying all of it's bad. It's just like the stuff that's currently being promoted and, and served to everyone and takes uh, just a fuck ton of computing power is so aggravatingly bad. Yeah. But yeah, the vast majority of AI hype is around shit like chatbots and image generators and all sorts of other stuff that most of us could happily live without. Mm-hmm. When crypto and NFTs were all the rage two years ago, there was a similar concern over the insane amounts of CO2 they were generating. And as soon as that craze died off, the tech bros immediately came out with a new way to pump stupid amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere because they have a pathological need to destroy the planet, apparently. Yeah, we, we stopped developing cool new technology uh, like the iPhone or whatever, and they're like, we have to find new and exciting ways yeah. to destroy the planet as fast as we, possible. We've got to do it. Yeah. Now, speaking of things no one needs, despite how much it's being hyped, AI NPCs in video games is something that's supposedly going to revolutionize video games. No matter how much actual game developers make the case that it's a stupid idea and a novelty that will get old very quickly and totally counterintuitive to what actually makes video games enjoyable. So the Verge published an article this week about a hands-on demo they had at CES with NVIDIA's AI NPC proof of concept. And their writer walked away with mixed feelings on his experience. So here's a little bit from their article. Last May, NVIDIA and its partner Convey showed off a fairly unconvincing canned demo of such a system. But this January, I got to try a fully interactive version for myself at CES 2024. I walked away convinced we'll inevitably see something like this in future games. Let me be clear. The characters I spoke to were effectively generative AI chatbots. They didn't feel like real people. We've got a ways to go before voices, facial expressions, and body language catch up to what's expected of a real-life interaction. There was sometimes a little robotic stutter and often a short delay before each NPC delivered their lines. Occasionally, they misinterpreted me. But many of today's biggest video games already set a pretty low bar for NPCs. Saddling up to the bar of a cyberpunk ramen shop to ask real questions with my real voice It exceeds what I expect from the average denizen in the Elder Scrolls or Assassin's Creed. Well, the internet proved uh, proved that to be total bullshit anyway, because the last week or so on Twitter has just been a best of series from the Elden Ring games of interacting with people and having it be the funniest thing that's ever happened. Yeah, (laughs) it is interesting how that just came around. Just I I never and I never played. uh, What was it? Oblivion. Oblivion. Yeah, it's so good. You should. It's a it's a pretty quick game considering. I feel uh, like at this point, scale of the others, there's like enough mods that I could probably play a pretty good looking version of it. Yeah. Uh, So what follows is a transcript of the writer's conversation with two NPCs at a ramen bar, and it's basically no different than feeding ChatGPT a few paragraphs of backstory and telling it to get into character. Because that's exactly what it is, with the added novelty of not having to type or read. So it goes on for a while, and even in the demo, there's lots of weird immersion-breaking glitches. But what really stands out is just how boring this is, despite objectively being a technical achievement. I mean, yeah, that's something. They did it. But, but how it long sucks. are you actually going to sit around and talk to an NPC? Right. This is like not. This isn't why I play video games. And, and nor is it have the guarantee of forwarding the plot that I'm currently playing or the quest that I'm on. Right. Because <laughs> I could just go off on a tangent with an NPC. It's it's a it's a it's a gimmick that will work for a very brief amount of time. Yeah. And then people are like, okay, I'm just going to play the game now. 
Yeah. Uh, in the end, the writer's takeaway is, the dialogue is not particularly inspiring. I certainly don't prefer it to proper lines from good characters in my favorite games. You can also see how they only spoke in short bursts and how they sometimes lost the thread. But maybe it could be used to populate a world with lesser characters or combined with good, canonical dialogue written by a real human being, where generative AI just helps it go further. That's kind of a big concession there at the end, but w whatever. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe we're the weird ones. But why would I want to just chat and shoot the shit with NPCs in a video game? I mean, it would be amusing for a little while, but what's the point? Having a friend. I, I mean, that's... If they, if they just came out and said, like, this is for fucking lonely people who do not have friends in real life and just play video games, I'd be like, well, at least you're being fucking honest. It's depressing, but you're being honest. Uh -huh. But yeah, talking to NPCs in a video game, it's about actually progressing through the game, getting information, world building, storytelling, getting quests assigned to you, etc. This is just a fancy chatbot. It feels similar to when we learned, you know, oh, Bethesda games, are, you're going to be able to generate an infinite amount of quests. The game will never end. <sighs> And yeah, it seemed pretty cool for a little while, but the difference between the procedurally generated quests and the quests that were actually scripted by writers and developers, it becomes apparent very, very quickly. Also, this is going to get increasingly frustrating because uh, in a lot of cases, the NPCs that you're overhearing or talking to you or talking to you are giving you information about either Easter eggs or the yeah. quest objectives themselves. This is going to muddy the waters of what you're actually paying attention to. Right, yeah, the dialogue in games, it's like, it, it's it, there for a purpose. It's relevant. They put it there for a reason. <laughs> it's either comic relief, or it's pertinent information to the quest, or it's like an Easter egg thing where you're like... Oh, yeah. I already don't like doing these NPC dialogues in games too much. Yeah. Um, but at least when you read a computer screen, or you talk to someone in like a Fallout or something... There's a reason. It, They're it saying... Make, the, it makes sense with the overall story. Yeah. This is just gonna, like, uh, the games are already fucking 80 hours long. Please don't do this. <laughs> That's my biggest the reason I hate this, is I don't have enough, I, don't, I just don't have time. This I don't is, have time. It's because this is cooked up in the most capitalist sense possible. They're just like, people want more games and interactive, and they'll pay more, and then we can make it faster by not having to write all this dialogue, and then we make more money. With yeah. no thought to like the art of it, and I mean, and this I is proven today by the, all the Asmon gold uh, back and forth. Oh, I didn't even see that. Where he's just like, people, consumers don't give a shit about art. Like, I mean, it's true. Like, people treat games like content. Yeah, and they are content, but it's like with games, especially people treat games as if they just come into existence out of nowhere and aren't the work of like hundreds of people. Yeah, who have put so much fucking time into it. It's just very weird that they have no appreciation for this thing that they claim to love, love. so much. And has affected their lives yeah. in, uh, in incredible ways. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, games are about storytelling. And humans absolutely still have the edge. They've got AI beat when it comes to storytelling. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Will AI get better at it? I don't know. Maybe. But given how inherently derivative AI is, this kind of thing, it seems like a poor substitution for actual well-written gameplay. Yeah. There was a great rant on Reddit like a few months ago where someone was just like, yeah, you basically making the argument like you just want content. You don't care about the art. But like they made a lot of good points where it's like roguelike games, super fun. Are they memorable? Do you remember like actual playthroughs in those? Not really well, as much. It's a different mechanic. Right. Yeah. But like this is seeking to make all games into that where it's just like, it's a. There's a difference. You're not between telling like, a story. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's it's hard to get into because yes, Binding of Isaac and Hades are two great examples of roguelikes done well that do have uh, yeah. an evolution of a story it's going a, it's on a and type you can do game, certain though. things. Yes, but like when you're it playing, is a very particular type of game. Yeah, when you're playing an it's actual like a, a open Skyrim. world game, you don't want that shit. Like you are participating in a story. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just in the metaverse and you're not even in there with fucking people. You're in there with robots that you can talk to and not feel lonely. Like I hate the idea of that. Yeah. Anyways, uh, we're all doomed anyway, so yeah. uh, take the slop. Eat the slop. Yeah. Go play uh, that fake Pokemon game where they used AI to copy all the Pokemon, and you can give the Pokemon guns. What is it, Pal World? I don't know. I don't care. I don't. Yeah, I'll never even yeah. fucking even watch the trailer for it. That's it's how like just 
morally opposed I am All to I it. know is that I've seen just so many like side by sides where they're like, this is, they, they literally stole this from like this specific piece of Pokemon fan art. Yeah. It's fascinating, but I don't care. Whatever. Enjoy your slop. Yeah. Anyways, make sure you like the video despite us being just, uh, I mean, I feel like we're pretty justified in being angry about this stuff, but you know, whatever. Like I the just, video either I'm way. I'm sorry. Uh, I am pro-human. <laughs> yeah. I like I like things that human beings Call make for all my you want. enjoyment. I appreciate the amount of work and talent that goes into creating things, and I think it does. And time. I don't a, mind the time taking a while either. Yeah, I think, and I also think it does have a noticeable. Like I've never seen a piece of AI generated anything that even comes close to anything that be created can, that can be made by a human. And if you can't tell the difference, that just means you're fucking uncultured. Like, That's a you problem. Go back and play like games like Skyrim or or Fallout 4 or Grand Theft Auto 5 or even 4 and just like listen to, like, like listen to the radio on Grand Theft Auto and shit like that. that it gives it makes the game yeah. livable in, a, in an experience and it's funny and it makes sense with the world and talking to people in Scott it's just like the idea that that would just become a chatbot where you could honestly in some cases take yourself out of the experience. Also I guarantee like within 24 hours of the first game that uses this technology, there will be threads online of like, how to jailbreak these things and get them, how to jailbreak this NPC and have it say the N-word. Yes. Yeah, like a, dra <laughs> a dragon will say the yeah. N-word. Yeah. Or talk about flying cars in a medieval setting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyways, yeah, like the video, even if you hate it, and <laughs> leave a comment, reply to a comment, and make sure you watch uh, our incredible uh, compilation of the best of DeSantis yeah, clips in the, the Ron DeSantis bloopers reel. It's <laughs> yeah. like 40 minutes long. Uh, check that out. And also we have a recent episode of Weekly Weird News. Check both of those out. We'll be back with some news done. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.